You know, it's <clears throat> if I could if I could go back and even have the most basic tools to be able to support my <clears throat> wife. I mean, and, and I'm just gonna say I was so scared. I was so ridiculously scared as a husband and you know as per our previous you know conversation about being this provider this protector and all that stuff i remember my wife called me from work and she goes hey i'm going to the hospital now at that time chrissy worked at a treatment house in orange county i literally got into my van i drove straight there I got to meet her at the ER and placenta previa is, it's very hard because when that, when the placenta moves and tears a little bit, there's blood. I mean, there is, there is more blood than I could ever imagine. And I just, I remember just hoping that everything was going to be okay, you know? And everything was bed rest was a whole thing, but if she got up too long, you know, she could start bleeding again. And, and I can tell you some of my behavior was just, that I was so terrified and so scared. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I, I literally didn't know what to do. So what did you do in that moment? Like how, how did you? Oh, I probably didn't have enough. <clears throat> grace i probably didn't have enough grace empathy and softness and um because i think i think when you don't have that language you're trying to intellectualize and yeah. men and do I, I could i and i mean i listened to the last episode and i was like oh Jason and I have very similar um, experiences of intellectualizing um, our spirituality, our healing. <laughs> and I was like, I know all this very well. And it's very hard um, because so much of it comes from our childhood. And do you and, think men want to, it's like men are trying to solve it. So if they can't solve it, then they like... <laughs> They don't know what to do. Okay. I literally just got off a discovery call because I do this uh, primal questions coaching. And I just, I met with a gentleman in South Africa. He's very successful. And his primal questions that so we have like seven, they're like our childhood wounds. <clears throat> and his is, am I good enough? And he's provided all of this value to his organization that he works with. And he's just like, I just don't know. He goes, I keep getting passed over for promotions. And I said, I said, first off, you are good enough. I said, but you don't know, you don't believe that. I said, so if we work together, I am going to help you embody that so that you won't get passed up for promotions. You won't get passed up um, in life. And he's, he's married. And I was just like, oh my gosh, you are good enough. You just don't know it. Or you don't believe it. And you, it's hard to believe something if you have never, um, I don't know. I don't know. I think about that. Like the not good enough thing I think hits for a lot of men, especially. Yeah, we for women too, like, it, like, in yeah. different ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, I'm trained in this. Uh, it's called the Primal Questions Coaching, and what it is is there's seven primal questions, and there I'll read them off because you, all of us in this healing space, will fully relate. And it's: Am I safe? Am I secure? Am I loved? Am I wanted? Am I successful? Am I good enough? And do I have a purpose? Shit. This is why we needed him back. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back, Sam. <laughs> I am so happy to be here. <laughs> I think a lot of our listeners are excited that you're back too. But 
I was wondering about that because I'm not going to lie. After our chat, I immediately got on your site and looked at how to book a discovery call. And I'm like, shocker. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Totally. I'm like, how do I convince my husband that this might be something he could totally look into? That's funny because we have similar stories. Uh-huh. It's, it's, it's so weird how that said, happened. Can you believe it? <laughs> weird synchronicity right there <laughs> and he also does he doesn't listen to our podcast so he would really like have no idea like what we talked mm. about i know it's okay but i'm okay with it i've come to terms with it i send him what's necessary i send him what's important and if there is an episode i think that like he could benefit from or something in it would help him oh. i am like you should listen to this one i don't well, you know. and, and I, you know, I listened back to our interview and after listening to the one you guys just released, I was like, and I want to say this in a, in a not bad way. Jason's not special. He's not unique. Do you know I'm how many special. I said that to him? And I know exactly what you mean. I know. <laughs> and I've had to like, when I say it. Like when he is like, I, maybe I'm just too fucked up. Uh, and I look at him and I'm like, you are not that special that you are the only person who can't be fixed. That's not, you are not an anomaly. Like this is not like, you know what I mean? And I've said it in that exact same way where I'm like, you're not that broken. You're not too broken. Nobody is too broken or too fucked up, you know? But I think so many people think they are. Well, that is, I, that is our own ego. That mm -hmm. is our ego. And as you know, when you do any kind of healing work, any kind of coaching, any kind of thing, I mean, even when I've worked with my own coaching clients, I'm like, listen, your problem's not unique. I hear this over and over and over again. You're not this special like case where you're unreachable or that this your pain is unique. This is the same. This is why I do the coaching I do. It's it's mm. the same primal wound and primal question all of us walk around with. And the sad part is that some people never realize it. And this primal wound or this primal question that you, I, all of us carry, Jason, it's actually because of that wound, our gift is the flip side of that. So we are creating safety. So like for me and like my primal question is, I'm, am I safe? Am I secure? They kind of go hand in hand. Well, my gift is that when people come to our house, they're just like, I want them to feel at home. I want them to feel safe. I want them to feel like they can be themselves. I want to make sure that they have good food. And like, if they want to sit on the couch and have a soft blanket or what, I'm like, I want to make sure that they have what they need because I'm secretly answering my own. Am I safe? And now I've just turned wow. it like, I am safe. And I can provide this for you. Wow. I'm really glad he's back on. We had some, we had some questions. Like oh, from, I saw the, I saw the question box go up and I was like, oh, this is going to be. It's going to be real good. You're ready. It's going to be real good. I, I hope I can speak from the heart on these questions, I'm but sure. that's all I have. You'll do great. But wait, before you ask the question, okay. I do want to say, um, Jason, if you do end up listening to this, <laughs> I don't mean it that he's not special in that way. And he knows that. And I've said that, but we, I also we, think we, anybody can take what you just said and it's a universal truth. It is. I tell my so kids this, say that. I'm like, I, I tell my kids, you guys are <laughs> special to us. You're special to the world, but your operating system is not totally unique. You, the way you see the world is special because it's unique to you. But a lot uh, of our struggles, they're all the they same. All, yeah. We all, we all feel like we're not good enough. We all feel like, am I doing this right? And now I realize no one knows what they're doing. 
anymore. Like nobody. It's like the human I experience mean, is a bitch. Well, before oh, he so got on, remember yeah. I was I was telling you like that person was like, okay, but I had this experience and I had this experience and I had this experience. I'm like, yes, also I have too. So have I. And so have other people. You know, it's a, that's a completely different situation. But sorry. And, and honestly, I I think what na- makes us special is how we choose to learn from the experiences that we have, thus creating new ways to connect and love with other people. Mm. It's our gift. It is our gift. I love that. All right. It's just about it's about reaching one person. That's Girl, it. Girl, I already clipped it. Oh, you did? Yeah, of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question time. Okay. Quiz oh. time. Oh gosh. All Ooh. right, let's get into it. A little Q and A. Okay. What is your biggest advice for men who feel that they have lost their confidence? Oh wow, this is this is a tricky one. And now we're we talking like confidence in the workplace? Are we talking confidence in life? Are we talking? I don't know. I don't know. It's general confidence is what the question is. And it's from a female. Yeah. So um, I don't know if she's asking for her partner or, you know, a loved one or what. Okay. So here's, here's my take on that. When you, when a man feels like they've lost their confidence, it means the way that they are doing life isn't serving them anymore because they've hit a plateau. They, they've reached this place where it's like, Hey, what was working is no longer working. And that's, there's this horrible time for most men to kind of go, what do I do? Like, am I doing this right? Am I, you know, what I was doing a year ago, I feel like it's not sparking joy. It's not, I'm not getting into it. And I honestly, my cl- a coaching client reached out to me this morning and he goes, Hey, I feel like I don't know what to do now. And I said, lean into that liminal space and learn from why you're feeling this way. So if your husband's feeling like I'm not confident anymore, it's like, it's okay. I think it's actually really healthy to go. I don't know. And there is different levels of depression, anxiety, some are situational, some are biological. And I really think that as, and I'll speak to the partner at this, sometimes you just have to let them feel this lack of self-confidence because for us men, we will be able to live in that like kind of crappy space for a while, but then there's going to come a point where we get so broken that we go, okay, now we need to need to reach out for help. And I think what it is, is it's a, a lack of confidence is literally a sign of, for me that like, what served you then does not serve you for the future. I feel like I'm really beating up on Jason here, but I just want to relate this back. And I don't, I hope he listens to this and doesn't hear this this way. But um, last year he had that moment where he was like plateauing in his job, in his yeah. career. Yeah. Um, and what I think men, especially, see, I feel like I'm beating up on men in general. And you guys know I'm not, and I don't have to explain that I'm not, but I think when they feel this type of way, they either learn to suppress it or they suppress it or they numb it or they run from it because they're like, I don't like this feeling. And I think what's really important is that you go towards it and sit with it and try to understand it. So when my husband was going through this, he was of sober mind. Mm -hmm. He had better coping skills. He was able to sit with it and then had this ginormous realization that he was not happy in his career anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's why he was getting passed up with promotion, passed up in promotions and not exceeding the way that he thought he should have been 
um, mm -hmm. and had this major, I was talking to Chrissy about this. I don't know if she told you this, but had this realization that he was in the wrong career and should have done something different. And he immediately started down the next path. Oh. I was like, okay, now that you know this, you know, you're unhappy in your career. You wish you had done this. What's yeah. next? So it's, and, and I'm, I'm going to, since we're using Jason and even <laughs> oh. myself, it's okay because our intimate partners are like our greatest teachers besides our kids. Really, you know, I hold up the mirror of like what my partner is coming up short with, like her own shortcomings. She does the same thing for me. And it's interesting because like when you really think about your lack of self-confidence, especially in Jason, any man, it's grief. It's, it's. It's a grief of that, your internal expectations, the work that you thought would reward you, or the intention behind you did that work. Wow. So if you're doing, and I, and I try to explain this to my oldest, who's, you know, 11, and I said, listen, don't chase what you think you're going to make a lot of money in because the whole world, I mean, all we have to do is we're surrounded by this. Do something that you find rewarding and then the money will come because the real wealth in this life is this com community relationships, spending time being present and you know, with, with Jason, yeah, he probably hit a place in his career and he was just like, he's just putting all that extra work in from his own expectations. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that, de that resulting depression is the grief. It is the grief that you, that your expectations were placed in the wrong place. That's a hundred percent accurate. So I will say whoever wrote that, <laughs> like from the other side of it, it's, it's, it's very different when now that he's, he's working towards something that's a lot more rewarding. And that was another thing I sat, he sat with too, is like, he went to where the money was and he went to what was easiest. He went to what he was good at. There was no other reason than like, this is easy. It makes good money. Works for me. And I'm going to just say generally, most men do that. I'm guilty yeah. of that. We all, we all, because too, when you live in a culture that is focused on the quickest way to success or visible success, and I'm going to use that visible or what visible. is shown. Like the nice house, the nice cars, the lifestyle. Yeah. When, when we live in a culture that that is the reward, like that is the standard that we are held against, how would we not naturally go there? Especially if that was the messaging for your entire life. Right. Yeah. How many, how many flame out stories do we know of like people just getting to the, the peak? <laughs> well, the problem is, is then when you're at the peak of, whatever your career, whatever, it's like, I'm still me. I'm still me. Oh my God. I cannot escape me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right. That's why we do so much. Like, that's why we do the work. Those external factors are not, they don't cut it. They might cut it for a little bit, but you're going to get to a place where you would just feel like it's not enough. But I think about like, I think about my stepdaughter's I have one stepdaughter that's in college. I have another one that is a senior this year. And the conversations that they are having with teachers, guidance counselors, it's, and so this is their thought process, which I'm trying to talk to them too, is like, what am I good at? What, what, um, what's going to make me a lot of money? Um, what can I tolerate in school? Mm-hmm. Those, that is their way of thinking instead of like, this is something that I like really enjoy and 
you know, feel like I have purpose and it, and it, it rejuvenates me or whatever. They don't think that they're because they're, they're trying to go, they're trying to fit in the box. And the box is the patriarchal culture that we were all born into. So we cannot escape Bullshit this. Box. Bullshit box. Love that. <laughs> and the thing is, is so much of how we operate is subconscious. That's why doing all this work and like really getting intentional and even trying capturing the way that we are doing things. I mean, how many times have you driven home and not been paying attention? Like it's muscle memory. I'm sorry. Like, yeah. That's why it's like so hard to, it's so hard for, to teach youth too, which is even harder because they're oh so pliable. And honestly, it's kind of a gift that they think they know it all because <laughs> it really is because I'm like, man, this is great. I told my 11 year old this morning, he was moody all. And I was like, I was like, Hey man, I guess you know it all. I'm, I'm so glad. Um, you know, but if I, I'm here, if you need help, but you can't talk to us this way. <laughs> and I'm like, no, nope. I'm so glad. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Next question. Okay. In the last episode, you said you were an HSP man. Yes. How did you come to understand and embrace that? Okay. This is great. Um, also add to that what HSP means because some people might not know. Okay. So an HSP is a highly sensitive person. Um, when I reflect now in my past, I, when I was a child, and this is, I had a lot of shame about this. Now I can air it out. Um, I had what they call a gag reflex. Okay. And so when I was a kid, certain smells would cause me to throw up. Wow. Coming to know somatics now, I would get, and since I had anxiety, I'd always get terrible stomach aches. Well, guess what they call the, your stomach? It's the second brain. So if you're not taking care of your stomach, you're internalizing that stress in your stomach. And so that's what I, I came to realize that now, you know, it's like, and you can say it's my chakra, whatever, but it was the part of me that was uncomfortable with certain things and then would create this sensitivity response. Wow. And so when I would get stressed in my teens and twenties, I would get these gnarly stomach aches, not knowing, you know, and now I have, you know, on this side of life, I'm like, oh, that was highly sensitive. My emotional place, my, my secondary emotion would be in my stomach. And so being an HSP, like I'm very careful with what I eat now, you know, you take care of my gut health and even when I cook and do even buy snacks for my kids, I'm, I'm really cautious. I'm like, Hey, if you're not taking care of like what you put in your body, your body's going to react to this. We were just talking about this. But um, it's yeah. physical and mental too, right? It like, is. It is. What you do physically and emotionally. Yes. And I think, so like my middle my middle son is probably got a little of the HSP. So he was on a soccer team. And when we would go to games, he, he would almost have a panic attack. And he's like, I don't like when people are yelling at me. And I was like, oh, so he has this sensitivity and it's like an antenna. And now when his attempt, like when he's taking in all this external stimuli and he's getting overwhelmed, I'm like, that's his sensitivity. All right, we got to, we got to leave. We got to move. I didn't have that. I just tolerated it for a very long time, which comes out in all kinds of different ways, you know, stomach issues, 
you know, anxiety, panic attacks. And so as an HSP, the world can be very loud. It can be very loud. It can be very dangerous because of just the external stimuli. And so now when you understand that, I can go, I think I'm going to sit, sit this crowd out, or I think I'm going to, you know, not eat that, you know, with what people are, are doing, you know, and, and I think when I coped with alcohol, I think a huge part of that coping is that it was that numbing of sensitivity. It's interesting that you're saying that because, um, my, I'm kind of realizing just listening to you talk that my four-year-old son is very similar. Yeah. So like, um, we made the mistake of, we put on the Lion King oh, and yeah. I think he was barely two <laughs> and I didn't even think about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's, it goes to the, gets to the part where Mufasa dies. Oh, I know. Oh. Like, and even now 36, <laughs> like, like my, like it gives me a pit in my stomach when he, he dies. Cause I'm like, no Simba, but he looked at us and he just looked at us and he would, he just, and I didn't think he would get it because he, he's never seen or been around death. He's never experienced death. And he was like traumatized. And then we're like, oh no. And then we go to a Paw Patrol movie and there's nothing scary. There's not like it's Paw Patrol, but, um, watched a there lot were of Paw Patrol. <laughs> there was, there was a part where one of the dogs was like the runt of the litter and like gets abandoned. Oh, and he, just, there were three times in that movie, he just cried. And it was because he was just, it, he, he was sad. And uh, even this morning, I was kind of getting on him because I was like, Kai, put your shoes on. Kai, put your shoes on. Put your shoes on. We got to go to school. We're in a rush. We're in a rush. And he just looks at me. He goes, Mom, too loud. Too loud. And, you know, he goes into rooms and he covers his ears. And I'm like, I'm starting to, like, put two and two together. like. He's very sensitive to people, to environments. Like he doesn't want to play soccer because there's too much going on yeah. and like how to navigate that as a little boy, because again, especially little boys are taught to like, you know, toughen up. It's fine. Like oh, you're yeah. fine. Get over it. Like, and I'm trying not to do that. I think, and, and so I've made all the mistakes with my kids. I've made lots of mistakes. I'm, we'll make plenty of mistakes. I apologize. <laughs> but one thing that I, I think for me, what transitions, calm transitions are really important for kids that have any kind of sensitivity or any kind of, you know, neurodivergence, because that's the correct term. So I have two that are neurodivergent and Chrissy's also neuro neurodivergent. And what I've learned too is that it takes an incredible amount of um, strength as a parent to go, this seems like not a big deal, but for your kid, it's a huge deal. Yeah. And, and it's, it's really hard because there are parts of me that I always want to be like, okay, tough it up. You know, it's like, all right, like we, we got this, but then I was like, well, if I force my kid to do something, he just totally hates and just doesn't what, a, what, what a disservice to him, you know, as mm -hmm. an adult, you know, it's like, it's one of those things where I'm like, oh my gosh, like he's going to remember that he got forced to do this forever. And it's outside of his comfort and it's outside of his awareness and, and it's too much. And when you're that little, you know, they're little kids living in a big world. And that's, that's scary enough. Yeah. yeah. And I forget that sometimes 
We all so do. let me let me um, ask you this: yeah. with Chrissy being neurodivergent and then having two children that are also neurodivergent, yes, um, is that sometimes a struggle? Because for me personally, oh, I sometimes struggle because I feel dysregulated and I feel overstimulated, and then I have to be a calm nervous system to this little person when I'm barely <laughs> like holding on by a thread. Yeah. <laughs> and that's something I'm navigating and, and we are working, he's in occupational therapy and we are working on like transitions and I've learned a lot in this process so much, but it's still re like, I'm still navigating a lot of things myself. I think, and this is, this is, it's incredibly difficult. Because you have to continually remind yourself that they are seeing the world so differently than you are and that the system, your like way of doing life, your schedule, those things serve you. They don't always serve them. And the, the level of patience that it takes and I'm going to say I lose my patience all the time. I just do because I'm also giving so much to our kids, to our partners, to our work that ourselves, we get over resourced where it's like when there's no gas in the tank and you still have to give. That's usually when I'm like losing it because I'm just like, I'm just wiped out. And that's when I have to go. All right. I'm sorry. I was being a jerk. I am sorry that I had that tone of voice. The magic's in the repair. And it's one of my favorite mentors is Terry real. And he does couples work. And he said, you know, if you fall apart, you know, or fight in front of your kids, you and your partner, he goes repair in front of your kids. He goes, because then our kids know that it's possible to repair. If you repair in private, all your kids are going to see is this fall apart and then never the journey back to each other. That makes so much sense. And that was like a light bulb for me. And I was just like, oh my gosh, we are totally guilty of not repairing in front of our children whenever we have discourse. Can you elaborate on some things that you guys do to repair in front of your children? Uh, physical hug, like hugs. And, and the message, um, you know, it's like, we'll apologize or we'll start talking in a better tone of voice. And then that physical connection, when your kids can physically see, because usually in conflict, you're this far apart. And one's going here, one's going there. To repair is to show you coming together, holding each other, telling each other that you love each other in front of your kids, because that might be the only model they see of repair ever. Oh, shit. Because, I... <laughs> because okay. if, if you're your, if it's their parents, we are to be the safe place. We are to be the ones showing them what relationship looks like. And if our words don't mat match our actions, how will they know? What a confusing message. I'm going to bring up a random, a rando. My job on this show is I'm the <laughs> random squirrel person. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I found a video, the video of my mom and I on Dr. Phil. And this was like 11 years ago. Oh my gosh. Um, and it's not on, it doesn't, it's not on streaming. Like you can't go to like, you know, Netflix and it's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. <laughs> now and then it like gets deleted from YouTube. So it's like very hard to find the full episode because I'll find mm. it. And then like a few months later, it's gone. So somebody put it on YouTube, found it and I'm rewatching it. And you know, I have in a way in the last year made this reconnection with my mom. Yeah. Um, there's a connection here. I'm rewatching it. And there is a part where 
Dr. Phil is asking her to apologize or if she had apologized. And she's like, yeah, I did. Oh. I, I married the wrong person. I'm sorry. I married the wrong person, like oh. putting it all on my dad. And he's like, well, that's not really an apology. That's, that's a justification. And, you know, and, but in that moment I texted you, do you remember this? I texted you that clip and I said, you know, when people hear my story with Jason and they're like, how the fuck did you stay that long? And hearing my mom apologize that way. And I'm like, oh my God, he did that. Mm. It was what I knew as an apology my entire life was that kind of, well, I'm sorry that you made me mad. Well, I'm sorry that you're too sensitive. Well, I'm sorry that I do this and this and this, and you're not grateful. You know, that's what I had heard my entire life. So when I married him, an alcoholic, and those were the apologies I got, those were the apologies that I accepted because I didn't know what a true apology was. And that has been a learning curve for the both of us because neither did he. He also didn't have that model growing up. Well, it's it's interesting. I'm currently reading The Myth of Normal by Gabor Mate. Mate. And I'm reading that too. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. But it's... what he said, and, and this makes more sense in your, especially in your situation, is that when you have like a level of dis, discomfort and disconnection and chaos, and you grow up in that, when you find an intimate partner that has that same dysfunction, it's like coming home because oh. your, your nervous system never had the safe, go back to the primal question, am I safe? Oh. Am I wanted? Am I loved? It's comfortable because that's what your body knew because your body keeps the score. Like that's why Chrissy does nonlinear movement. And when you can move that trauma out of your body at a cellular level, because we all hold trauma, big T, little T at a cellular level. When we move that out of our bodies, that's why I feel like when we heal, we can't tolerate anything else because our sensitivity level is coming back, back up to this level. So our window of tolerance for chaos, dysfunction, disconnection, we don't know what to do with it. And that's why we're just like the, the rage of Kali. You're bringing makes- up your floor of tolerance to where it's supposed to be. Holy and then shit. you don't even know what to do with it because, and that's why you get, that's why, you know, you get into rage, you get into anger, you, you, you don't have any, you know, bandwidth or like there's no, you can't handle anything. It's because literally you're resensitizing your nervous system to where it was supposed to be when you were a kid in a healthy relationship. Holy shit. <laughs> Like that tolerance, like I say that, but hearing you describe it that way is so much easier to understand because I say like when I rage now, I never did that before and he's done horrible stuff in the Uh, past. So it just seems like the things he does now, I'm like, that's what set me off. It doesn't even make sense that it does, but what you just said makes it make sense. Well, it's like, all right, I had, I've had several friends pass away from overdoses. So when you get clean from opiates, we'll use opiates. When a normal user goes back to use again, they go back to the dose they left off on. And guess what? Their body has healed. It's brought, I mean, I haven't drank in like, over three plus years. I mean, Jason hasn't, you know, if I were to have a single drink right now, my body would be like, hold up. What's going on? Because my body has resensitized and come back to homeostasis of our original, you know, body. 
And so it's, it's no different. What you're doing is as you heal, you're bringing, you're, you're coming back to home. You're coming back to the way that your body was supposed to be or it still heals. I mean, that's when you do somatics, how many times have the ailments that you were suffering from go away? Damn. Yeah, we were, we were just talking even, you know, we, we interviewed a functional practitioner, Michaela, and then Leah and I started working with her yeah. and, you know, my, my gut was oh, all yeah. messed up. My hormone hormones were all messed up. Everything was bad. Yeah. And so, you know, I did a lot of things to get myself into like a parasympathetic sympathetic state to, you know, yeah. lower my cortisol levels. But she's like, I really think that you need to stop eating gluten. Yeah. Like I like it's it's causing you inflammation. What get it? Yeah. Anyways. Um and so I did. And I have. And that's my lifestyle. But I was just telling her today, if I if I eat gluten now, and I spent my entire life <laughs> eating gluten. Yeah. If I eat gluten, you got like a baby gut. Oh, I will look pregnant. I'm going to, I'm just going to say it. Yeah. I'll probably poop my pants. Uh, yeah. But... I, get, I get so sick and I'm like, mm. I, I used to eat gluten every day. Right. Like it wasn't a big deal. And now if I eat it, it's like, my body's like, nah, bitch, mm -hmm. we don't like this. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. And it's wild. Mm. And so it's to me, I'm like, it's not worth it. It's not worth me feeling like oh, God, no. shit. It's not. So I just don't. And it's just, it's just my life now. But that's weird. Cause we were just talking about that, how I was like, but you ate gluten before we, we did this yeah. and you were just fine. But it's like, well, oh my God, it's the same with the emotional part. So what I, I liked it and I heard this analogy and it's, it's super fascinating. And anyone who has even a hint of neurodivergence or have had a certain amount of trauma, you think of this as your body is like a Ferrari. Well, an exotic car takes a ton of maintenance. And if you don't put the maintenance into this exotic car, it's a piece of junk. It's a, an expensive piece of junk. It's the same thing if you're not... You know, it operates to a certain point and then there's a point of no return where it's like, I just can't ever get better. I'm not doing this better. I'm can't like, what, what's going on? And so much of it is, is that our body is so miraculous that it can carry so much stress for so long, but there is always a tipping point of tolerance where it's like, I can't go anymore. And it's, and it's, it's diet, it's exercise, it's getting, you know, outside it's basic things that our body needs, but we, we forget that in the name of, name of productivity, success, striving and appearance. Shit. <laughs> Shit. The fact there have been so many signs and synchronicities today that have been like just wild. Yeah. Like conversations we had before and then it's coming up now. Like keeps yeah. it's been happening to us all day. Um, all right. What was the other question? We have another question. <laughs> I love these. Not a simple yes or no. Jeez. <gasps> there's there's okay. no simple questions. Uh uh. No such thing. Um have you used psychedelics on your healing journey? And if so, what? So. And how? So <laughs> how? So here in the great state of California, we have legal ketamine. And I think I hinted at this on our last episode. And mm -hmm. so after, after I did on-site and I came back and I started on my healing journey, did a lot of and I, I did the same thing that Jason did. It's like I tried to intellectualize my way out of <laughs> spiritual bypassing. <clears throat> ah. And and I think oh, that we talked about it in the last episode. Okay. I, I know see. this. I know this so well. And it's I feel like we need to go visit. It's so funny because 
I am, you know, I'm a curious reader. And so I just started diving in. I have a great therapist that I I wouldn't be here without our therapist. I mean, really. Is it Christy? I'm no. just kidding. You know, we get that question a lot. And I can tell you, it wouldn't, no. and it wouldn't work. And no joke, I told her once, I was like, you're my partner, not my therapist. I think that's I've true. I've heard though. that before. Heard that before. That's true, yeah. though. It is true. I think you can heal together, but you need to do your own individual work. And then in that individual work, and this is why I want to speak on this, when a husband or a wife or two partners start to get healthy, the one partner that's still like kind of behind the other one, because there's always one partner in front of the other, you know, the person that's out in front, that partner needs to have an incredible amount of grace and empathy for the person that's behind. Because if you're critical of that other partner that they're not catching up, that will shut down that healing. <sighs> and I say that because I hear this all the time, all of the time. And so I came back from onsite, I finished our house, which was a feat. And I've never been more joyful to be completely unemployed, working on my own house. I got time to reconnect with my kids, went to therapy twice a month, did a ton of internal work. And I think with talk therapy, you know, we, you get to certain plateaus where you're like, okay, I'm, and there came a point where in my therapy journey with my talk therapist, I finally was like, I kind of feel like maybe I'm just come once a month now, you know, like kind of just to check in, just kind of decompress. And in California, um, ketamine therapy is still fairly new. As you guys know, it's, it's a very new treatment for use. And ironically, Chrissy brought it up first and then she went and did it through field trip, which is a legal um, ketamine therapy here. And we're talking, you meet with an advice nurse, an RN, a therapist, a licensed therapist. Then you go into the office, you do like three pre-meetings. You know, you do a whole medical background check. You do all of this. So as women, tend to heal first before the men. She comes, she's like, I hadn't even finished our main house. And she comes to me and she goes, Hey, I think I'm going to do ketamine therapy. And I was like, cool. I'd listen to enough <laughs> podcasts and, you know, a lot of different yeah. things. And I said, if you feel called to that, how am I going to stop you? And, and it's because it's federally legal here. And it's, I mean, Everything is by the book. I was like, okay, they're going to make sure it's safe. You're going to be in a safe place. Why not? So she did it. She had all these, you know, revelations and kind of it gave her a place to kind of let go of certain things that, as I know now about neuroplasticity, you, you can't always access some of these things through um, talk therapy or EMDR, or lifespan integration. So she had this amazing experience, and she's like, you should go do it. And I was like, I'm not ready. And I didn't feel ready. And this is something that I think for, this is my advice to anyone, is that when you are ready, you will know. <laughs> and so I got through building our house. I did all that stuff, got us all moved in. You know, everyone kind of went back to normal, the world but opened back up. And I had, you know, I wasn't really getting as much out of my talk therapy as I wanted to, because I'm always hungry. If I'm going to pay for something, I want I to be all in and, and just give it the best I can. And I remember this, there was just one day where it's like, I think it's time because like I had this, like, 
there wasn't like this question mark anymore. It was like, I've never done anything like this. I, I think it's time. And so I even, I brought it up to my partner and I said, Hey, I think I want to do this. And she was like, finally, I'm like, okay. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> she's like so excited. And I was like, all right. And it just happened to fall on um, a week and she was out of town. So it was really beautiful because I called the clinic because there was one near us um, about 30 minutes away. And I said, you know, do you have any space? And they were like, yeah, we actually have this day. And I was like, perfect. So I did the intake, um, met with the RN. I met with the, you know, the whole team. And so I, I, you know, I, I was, and I honestly, I was nervous because it's, it's a, it's a big deal. You know, you don't know what you're going to see and be ready for. And I just remember in that moment, I was like, all right, well, I guess the plane is going to take off tomorrow and we are, we're going to see what happens. Yeah. And, and this is why I'm also like the whole do it yourself one kits and stuff like that. <laughs> terrify me. And we can speak on that after. Yeah, I want to get into that later. And so I got a ride, you know, I took an Uber down to the, the clinic because <laughs> ketamine is a very pow powerful substance. It is, it is no joke. And I, I take, and as someone who, you know, coped with substances, I have the utmost respect for how powerful anything that can alter your state. And I think having that as a respectful place is paramount to healing. Even, even EMDR, some of the, you know, brain spotting and some of those, I've done EMDR. I couldn't drive after it because the, wow, I, I was so emotionally drained and that was <sighs> sober. So this is a, not a warning, but like heed, <laughs> heed this work in any way, because if you are not ready, it could be the worst experience of your life. Thank you for saying that. I, I mean, I, and I mean that, and I'm like a, I'm a tough dude, whatever, <laughs> but it was almost as if my body knew and my mind was like, all right, I think, I think you have enough of the ther the sober therapeutic tools ready for this experience. The therapist was there. It was, I mean, the whole team is incredible. And I remember showing up to the clinic, you do all this thing and they're like, okay, are you ready? And I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, you know, and they're like, are you afraid? And I was like, no, I said, but I think it's okay to have a little bit of that, um, that cautiousness. Anxiousness? Yeah. yeah. I mean, how, I don't know how else to explain it. And you know, for me, and I can share my intention because they're like, Hey, what is your intention? I said, my intention for this experience is just to return to the, for me to be the most authentic version of me. Ooh, that's a big one. Now, mind you, and for all the listeners, I've done 15 years of therapy experiential therapy at on-site, um, EMDR, you know, uh, I went to another healing place in Abilene, Texas called the healing, the gold monarch healing center. We did all kinds of, you know, guided meditations, all that kind of stuff. So I've run, I've tried, I've meditated, you name it. I've tried almost all of it. And I realized too, like, having those experiences not altered it gives your 
your mind the tools that it needs to experience what's going to come up. Mm. I'm I'm glad you said that because we get a lot of messages where let's say, you know, Leah posted we a video series of her ketamine treatment. We've talked about our heroic journeys yeah. um, with psilocybin. Um, we've talked about, you know, doing MDMA with our partners as yeah. a form of like couples therapy. Yeah. Um, and so people take that sometimes and they run with it. They say, okay, mm. I want to do that. And I have mm. to say, okay, okay, okay. Like, Hold again, up. but I say, you know, you know, you, something you really need to be ready for. And they're like, I'm ready. And then the more we talk to them, um, they're not really doing the work. Um, they don't really have good coping strategies. They have mm. no support. They have no mm. support. They're not seeing a therapist. Um, just came off meds. Those, those, the first time, like, those are decade. all just like giant red flags. And I'm like. Yes. Yeah. And so. It's like one after another. Like. Right. And so it's. I think they really do think that, but they don't don't necessarily know what that means. And so having that conversation to be like, you know, I, I really think that you need some support with a therapist first before we even talk and, about doing a heroic. And and I think, and this I'm going to speak on this because we live in a culture that praises hacking. As mm -hmm. an idea, let's, let's get from point A to point B as fast as we can in the most successful mm -hmm. way we can. And, you know, we all do that. The thing is, is that a healing, you can't hack the healing journey. You can't hack undoing a lifetime of operating at a certain way with trauma, carrying stress, carrying traumatic experiences inside you 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 cannot do that fast because as you both know it's like you even said it in the other podcast it's like it's like a layer and then another layer and then another layer and i i think too it's about that journey of discovery is where really the healing starts and it gives you reverence for the experience. Yeah. Because we're only, like we said in the last one, you're going to arrive when we die. That's it. And so, you know, for, because it's, it's, it's very sexy now for like psychedelic healing. I mean, in, if, if you haven't seen the Netflix, Michael Pollan series, you know, how to change your mind. He's yeah. even very cautionary, like, hey, these are things of profound respect, and there's no right answer in this. And so it's it's very interesting because our culture has changed that where it's like, I'm going to fix it right now. You know, and so for when I came to it in my own experience, that was a good you know, I've done 15 years of work to get to this point where I could feel comfortable navigating that subconscious space. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how else to just say, be careful, be cautious, be Let's aware. Let's just say you did 15 years of preparation to go into this experience and it's not to say that like that 15 years was leading to this, but like that 15 years was all prep work, prep work. for this experience and, and for every experience after this. Yeah. And I think we have to have profound respect for what that, that is because that journey is really where the healing has happened. And so for me, when I decided I made this decision to, experience this. I remember they, 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 you know, they do, I'm sitting there with the therapist and the RN comes in and they administer, you know, this medicine and they're like, okay, well, I just want to warn you. As soon as you receive this medicine, 
it will come on very fast because it does. Because in in legal clinics, it's done intravenously. It's not done through pill form. And so you have an IV. I had like a heart rate monitor. I mean, I had a, I'm hooked up to the machines, right? You're, it's, you're like in a clinic, probably the nicest medical clinic I've ever been in in my entire life, <laughs> you know? And I put on the eye masks and I'm sitting there with my therapist and he actually started um, the East Forest um, guided meditation for psychedelic practitioners. Put the weighted blanket on. And it was interesting because in about seven minutes, I just felt this profound sense of letting go. And then all of a sudden, what I would see, I just, I was literally plummeting the depths. And I felt like I was falling through or what I was seeing was like a blue, black oil painting with like light flares. And ketamine is very, it, there's three phases now that I've done enough research and I did plenty of research and they, they describe what's going to happen. There's three distinctive stages that you go through. And I just remember I... It just felt like I got buried in the earth and I was just there in that, that darkness and that abyss, not, you know, and it's, and it was interesting because for me, I was never, I was never scared. Like it was because I, you know, you do enough prep work. You're like, I kind of know what I'm in for. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I just remember, I felt like I kind of landed at the bottom of my soul or however you want to describe it. <laughs> and I remember just being there and I was just like, whoa, 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 whoa. And I remember in a moment, I saw my children But I saw them of the essence that they were part of me, um. which was such an incredible experience for as a father, because for us dads, we kind of live outside of that connection that a mother has with their, their child. And I just remember like, just like, oh my word. This is truly incredible. And I just, and, and there was this overwhelming sense of reverence of like, oh my God, like I truly get the sense they are, they are part of me. They're not just outside of me, but they are part of me, which was a gift in itself for any father, you know, and that's something that we get kind of disconnected as dads or as men, you know? Yeah. Yep. And I saw Chrissy as Kali. Ooh. Just. Kali Mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Wow. <laughs> and so. That's awesome. That was really interesting. And I was just like, whoa, this is so cool. Like. She's powerful. She's a very powerful <laughs> woman. And for me, because I suffered from anxiety for so long, you know, as a kid, I just remember being in that space and you, you kind of, you know, you don't really know what's going on, but I met up with the six-year-old version of me oh. and I knew it was me. I mean, it was as clear as day. I was like, oh, there's me. And I remember and, and, and I've done inner child work before, but this is where for me, it was like part of a breakthrough for me because inner child work is so hard to, to see yourself at those ages. And I just remember like seeing that little version of me. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I mean, 
I had I was a total toe head as a kid, blonde hair, blue eyes, and just that happy little kid. And I just remember like going over and I was just like, I got to tell you, you don't have to be anxious. All the things that you worried about as a, and I'm going to tear up because it's still so powerful. I remember I was like, listen, you're going to worry about this. You don't have to. And I remember like just going, remember when you worried about this, it didn't come true. Like you don't have to live in that space. And it was, it was almost as if I was giving permission to my inner child that it was okay to experience those things. And that experience is what got me to this side. But, and I just was like, dude, I'm so sorry. Like, you're going to worry about this. It's not going to come true. You're going to, you know, obsess over this. You don't have to. And so it was this interesting connection where I was just like, dude, you don't have to worry about all these things that you are going to worry about, but you are going to worry about those and that's okay. And that's, that's inner child work in a nutshell of like reparenting yourself from that perspective. Yeah. And it's not easy. It's, it's not easy. It's, it's incredibly hard. And so I, I mean, I was just there with that six year old version of me. And I was just like, and we had this just long conversation. It was just, and I just remember just like having so much empathy for that little version of me. And then there was this, and you know, with ketamine, there are these certain phases. It's a you're like, you're under for about 90 minutes, maybe two hours max, you know, cause it starts to wear off pretty quick. And I just remember we, it was almost as if we went through all the things that we struggled with. And then we kind of got this point where I just looked at him. He looked at me and I was like, okay, we're good. We're good. And what was really wild, and this is, you know, I, now, and I did this several years ago, so it it's taken me still years to even explain or, and there's probably parts that I miss. But what was interesting is I remember we both looked at each other and then we were standing in, in front of a grave site. And it was my name. And it was the date from 1984 to 2020. I think it was, was it 2021 or 2022? I, very blurry. And it was like, we were standing in front of the, that version of me that got us to this place. And we both were like, I remember like giving my inner child a hug. Wow. And then I, wow. I remember just, he gave me this smile, which was just characteristic of me. And I, I, I looked at him, he looked at me and I just was like, I see you again, but we don't have to do this anymore. And this is cool. Oh my gosh. I th Inner child work is really hard. I think for people who are analytical and very logical, it's, it doesn't make sense because it's all, it's all feeling. It's all, it's all emotional. It's all soul, you know, heart space work. And I just remember like walking away and, you know, and I saw some other stuff, you know, I kind of, I, I came into this, you know, the beautiful light that we just all hope to experience. And I remember I was so present in the moment that the therapist thought I was asleep. Oh. And, and he was like, and he was like, they, 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 and they even will tell you like some people fall asleep and they're like, we'll put a, a hand on your shoulder or something. And I felt a hand and I was like, I gave him the, I was like, I'm not done. 
I literally was not done. <laughs> I literally told, and I was like, even in my subconscious, I was like, I need like a few more minutes. And wow. so I had this, you know, and, and I just had that sense of peace, like where when you break through to a place where you can move through life unencumbered, you know, and I just remember waking up and I just remember like, just that feeling of peace of just like going, Oh my God, I did that work. That was so powerful. And then I came to. That's beautiful. And you're never going to forget that. Uh, I've, How I've, could you forget? I started, that? I mean, I started tearing up every time I, and I've only told this, you know, I haven't told it to a lot of, a lot of people because it just doesn't make sense sometimes. But in this space, you know, for the people that will listen, this makes sense. And yeah. I just remember having this profound sense of like, okay, you're okay. You can do hard things. We can move through this next season. And, you know, I can always go back to that moment when things are really hard and just go, okay, you, you got this. You're good. Things are going to be okay. Even if it's hard, it's going to be okay. The whole safety thing of that, like, you know, it's, it's legal. Technically it's, it's legal in mm -hmm. across the U S it's yeah. used off label. Um, I think kind of what you were saying about like psychedelics being like, um, trendy, oh. trendy, or, or I don't know what you said, but along those sexy. lines, it's sexy right now. Sexy. It's those doses are not sexy. They just to be the first one to share that. <laughs> Me drooling on myself, crying, like that's not sexy. But I, I think it's interesting because I feel like I had a very safe experience similar to yours where the medicine was respected. The medicine was treated with reverence. It was, we did a lot of integrate or prep work. Like yeah. we had three sessions beforehand. We did an intention setting session and then we had our post integration session. And then hearing from people on TikTok and Instagram, that's like, I just went to a clinic and they hooked me up to an IV. I didn't have a therapist. And I'm like, Oh my God, it just makes me sad and angry. And <laughs> I almost want to, like, that's not the same thing. No. Even though it is. You know? And it's sad that that's what's happening. Well, <clears throat> here's something. We all, we all seek, we all seek an escape from our reality. We, we, I mean, that's why addiction yeah. occurs. That's why consumerism, consider, you know, occurs. When I did this a while ago, I, I didn't think it would fix me because after my experience, I was still me. I was still home. I'm still the same person. I still have all the shortcomings and failures that make up me. But what it did is it, it just allowed me a perspective that allowed me to go, oh, when this comes up, this, my reaction or my experience might be less. And that single treatment, you know, and I, I look at it as, as a treatment. It's when I did EMDR, yeah. I mean, I was like, EMDR, I remember like, couldn't drive home because it was so intense and it's the same kind of thing where it's like, I don't need to do that again because I, you know, I have, I've had friends who've done it multiple sessions and I think it really comes down to if you have a ton of trauma and you have a lot of pain that you cannot let go of, then yes, do multiple treatments. But I think it's more important is the integration post that experience 
because that is where the habit and the, the, the healthy coping mechanisms and the healthy journey will keep moving you forward. I love that. I need to do it. <laughs> I know. I would like to do it. <laughs> and, you know, and, and I'm, I'm just going to say, like, I've had enough people, as you guys too, you know, ask me, like, well, what was it like? Like, oh, that should fix me. And I was like, listen, no, 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 no. This will not fix you. I said, with any kind of healing system, the system isn't going to fix you. And you're not to be fixed. You just need to learn how to operate at a healthier version, just an upgraded mm -hmm. version. As we all upgrade our phones and we have software updates all the time, you were good. You just had some bad habits or some bad messaging or bad operating systems and behaviors. We're just going to do, just help you pull those away from who you really are. I love that. No one's ever fixed. You're really not. You can't get to that. Point. Well, and people are looking for answers outside of themselves. Yeah. Where the answer is in you. Like you are the medicine and, and we've talked about this before. Like sometimes I don't, you know, people don't necessarily understand that, but you, you describe that very, very well. Well, and when you really think about it, anyone who's successful in their healing journey they did it themselves because there comes a point where you reach a place where you've done enough work you have the the tools that when the same problem comes up you have the right tools for that job you can go oh i've been here before Last time I did it that way, this time I'm going to do it this way. Mm. And that's, that's, so, the, that's the success. I love that you just said that too, because there's been a post that I've seen like three times now that has <clears> been <throat> shared. And it, I saw it again on my Instagram a few days ago that said, oh, that's cool that you do breath work and psychedelics, but have you ever tried feeling your feelings? And oh, it like, a hundred percent, excuse me. Because part I'm like, like, we've talked about this. I'm like, okay, let's, let's, let's break this down a little bit because we do that and we yeah. don't do breath work every day and we don't do psychedelics no. every week or every month or no. even every six months. These I do breath work every day. You do do breath work every yes. day, but not like in that, like right. the, you do different types of breath work, yes. but it's like, yeah. these are tools for us. We do have the capacity to sit with our feelings and move through life. And when something new comes up, we have these tools in our tool belt where we're like, okay, yep. I've tried everything to figure this out. I'm at a plateau, kind of like what you were talking about earlier with the therapy. Yep. I'm at a plateau. What can I do to help me move through this and not just cope? or feel it, but like, help me understand it. So when it happens again, I have a better understanding and capacity of working with it without reaching for the tools. That's the way I see it. Here's the thing. You cannot heal what you cannot feel. And honestly, even, you know, with some of my coaching clients, they're like, well, I don't really feel like I'm connected to myself. I said, that's good. That's valid. It's important to not know how to feel because then you can have this awareness because it's like sitting in that discomfort of not knowing what to do sometimes is our greatest teacher. And that uncomfortable nature of being like, I feel so out of sorts. And it's like, you know, it's like, I know plenty of people that are like, oh, I'm doing ayahuasca, I'm doing ketamine, I'm doing, you know, psilocybin. And it's like, well, you haven't even <clears throat> integrated the lesson from the right. previous experience. And you just, it's, it's, we human beings love comfort because we want to feel good all the time. 
And hard times teach you how to be good. Like you, you learn your biggest lessons and your greatest successes and your most joy from difficult experiences. And, you know, it's like people are like, I want to just be happy. And it's like, I don't believe in happiness. I believe in joy because joy is a combination of sadness, happiness, and the whole spectrum of experiences and how you look at things. Yeah. And we talk a lot too, um, cause you know, there have been people who have messaged us and said, ah, oh, I just judge you. Cause I thought you're just like some moms who were just like on drugs, like, and you created an Instagram and a podcast because of it. And that was legit a message. Once. That was actually a message. And so, you know, I think people who don't listen to us <clears throat> and maybe don't understand our content, they may you know, take it and run with it. Like, oh, they're just doing drugs. We talk so much about intention of doing yes. everything. Yeah. And it's not just psychedelics, the intention of doing breath work, the intention of meditating, the intention of going to therapy, like madness. and all of it. Here's and, and so, yeah, there are people who do psychedelics and it is like a way to party. It is a way to escape and it, and, and it is a way to numb. But, but again, it intention. goes back to that intention. I think what's, because I grew up in the D.A.R.E. era, so we, you know, for us, <laughs> you know, and, and I think what's, what's hard is that everything we were taught that was bad is now being used to help people, especially people that suffer from PTSD, CPSD, and all those things. These compounds are truly helping give people their lives back. So really the mental health problem in our country, you know, is we're flipping what we learned upside down and going, yeah, we don't want you to do a bunch of MDMA or, a, you know, ecstasy, you know, for fun. It's like, no, let's do it with, it's all about context. And, and even, even, breath work in it's all about the context and the intentionality and the energy behind it. That's where the work is. And I think it's so important, you know, and the, my first thing is like always, you know, when people are like, well, Hey, I should do this. And I was like, nah, man, oh, these, when you open Pandora's box, if you do not have this, yeah. You know, if you don't have a system and a context and a set and a setting and you are not ready, it's terrifying. It could be the worst experience of your life. And talk it's about traumatizing. Re traumatizing. Yeah. Yeah. No coping skills. I mean, nothing. No. And so I'm, that's my caution, my cautionary tale, as you guys know, too. It's just like... Healing is very hard. It's a very hard, it's a very hard um, journey to choose. And a lot of people don't want to choose the hard work. No, true. And that's okay. They're not ready. Yeah. But I think that's what happens is any, yeah, I think too, what it is, is that healing occurs when the weight of your former self can no longer carry your own baggage. Um, write that in. Yeah, I have, I have, I have, so, I have, I write this down. <laughs> um, so I have a, just notes of like quotes or things people say where I'm like, that's so good. And I literally like, I write, <laughs> I write it down in my phone. So. I'll have Stay to, I'll, yeah, I'll have to rewatch this and write it down later. And it's, it's just, you know, we're all just trying, we're all just trying to find that place where we can just be us. And that's hard in all phases of life. And I always just believe you got to have a lot of grace for yourself and what got you to this point. And our past is our past. We can't go back. We can't rewrite those things. But I think it's incredibly important 
to honor that former version, but leave it and let it go. And, you know, a lot of people too, you know, are going to remember that firm, that former person. And I told the client, I said, listen, people aren't going to forget the former version of you. So all you can do is be the version of yourself that you want to be and show them. And it might take 10 years. It might take 20 years, but at least you're feel like you're at home in yourself again. Yeah. That's a hard one too. Yeah. It's okay. a J I mean, Jason knows, Tony knows, I know we, yeah. we all know that former version and we're always going to come in contact with people from our past and they're like, you did this. And I'm like, I did. And I'm sorry. Did. And the person and that radical acceptance of our former actions. And this is, this is a recovery tool. The more radically honest you are with yourself, the easier it is to move forward and, and, and have that honesty of like, yeah, I screwed up. I was a jerk. I did that. And that radical honesty makes, makes your authenticity so much more real and intentional. And it, that is where the healing really, you can sense your own healing. And that, that's, that's the beauty. That's why I'm sharing, you know, yeah. and vulnerability is the ultimate shame killer. True. Like Brene Brown. He is. 100%. <laughs> the same, but different, but awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Do you have any, was that the last That's question? It. Yeah. And we gotta, we gotta wrap it up. I gotta go pick up my kiddo. Yes. Thank you so much Thank for giving you. us more of your time for part two. I think that was like much needed, much, much, much needed. I necessary. am also going to manifest 2024 meeting you and Chrissy. That Making would a trip be fun. Happen. Something happen. IRL in real life. In real life, <laughs> not on the computer. And, yeah. And it's and it's beautiful. And that, like the one thing that I can say to you know to leave this for your partners, your kids, and everyone: healing is possible, and change is doable. Because when you start to live your own truth, it just, you can just be that, you know, and it's important. Life is not Love that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I already clipped it. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you will forever go down in our history book as like the most clippable man that we have ever, <laughs> person, not even man, person oh. that we have ever interviewed. Definitely, and definitely I'm way more clippable. Than the uh, um, rehab guy, rehab <laughs> owner, <laughs> and and I will just say anytime, anytime, I w I would love to come back and chat anytime because it's maybe we could have I, you and Chrissy on. <laughs> that will be that's a that's an interesting one. We just were on that podcast, the onsite workshop, and that was really interesting to talk about our healing journey together as a couple. Yeah. I think that'd be good. Oh, send us the link to that. Oh, well, girl, Sarah, I already got it. You do? Okay. All right. <laughs> yes. I want to listen to that. All right. Thank you, Sam, so much. Thank, Thank you, you for all, everything that you do. Um, and hopefully, again, you'll be hearing from our husbands, maybe. <laughs> our partners. All I right. would, I we'll would to love to. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> awesome. Bye. Bye.